So hello everybody and welcome to this workshop. I see we have 10 participants right now. Uh, do we have uh, eight attendees, two panelists? Do we have any idea how many more we're looking for? So let's give a couple of minutes for everybody to, to get online. All right, now we have 11 attendees and uh, two panelists. So. All right, so I think we can get started without further ado. So welcome to this Abu Dhabi University workshop. We'll be talking about starting your own business today. So just a couple of words on the background so usually when i was graduating like 25 years ago people usually wanted to work for big international companies or maybe government uh, but now i think more and more young people prefer starting their own business so being your own boss it doesn't mean that it's easier it's maybe a harder route to take but at least you have this autonomy and you can try to fulfill your own dream there's no visual, uh, just audio. Um, all right, well, uh, let me uh, share my screen. Just say if there is some other challenges. I think we should have visual. All right, so I'm going to start uh, right now. So we're going to be using this tool today. It's called Mentimeter. And it is kind of an interactive tool whereby I will be sharing you here a code. It's a, it's a QR code, uh, or you can scan that with your device or on your phone if you have one. So we will have some interaction today. So therefore, it would be good if you now grab your phone and uh, try to uh, take a scan this QR code. or. You can also alternatively go to the www.menti.com website and then put on the code A37649. So let's give that a couple of minutes for everybody to get on board. Other than that, uh, I don't really have many housekeeping rules. So we have the chat, so you're more than have, welcome to put your uh, questions on chat or also the Q&A. So if you have some specific questions on topics, please let me know. We can also then a bit later have a Q&A session. So if somebody wants to speak, let's do that. But now first, let's try to work with Mentimeter. We have some interaction here and then the chat and the Q&A boxes. All right. Well, the instructions can be shared again at the later stage if we have some issues connecting. But let's try to get started then and go into the content. So how to start up your business. So let's talk a little bit about the characteristic of an entrepreneur, then about the, let's say, um, technical skills that you need for starting a business. And then we can ideate a little bit and go step by step guidebook on how to really do it in a real life. But my first kind of warm up question for you would be how are you feeling today? So if you're on the Mentimeter, you see we have something called Word Cloud. And you have two options uh, to insert your input. So we have a little feeling of how everybody's feeling today. Let's give it a few minutes. Okay, wonderful, awesome, well rested. 
That's great. At least you have somebody on online. I have happy. Yeah, good. Very positive vibes here today. That's perfect. But it's Sunday. Everybody's fresh from the weekend. But this is how you see how easy this Mentimeter really is to use. So we don't need any specific uh, skills to do it. Awesome, good, happy. It's a very nice tool also for you to use. It's um, free of charge for certain uh, features. So if you want to do some interactive presentations for your schoolwork, please keep this Mentimeter in mind. Oh, we have one sad one. Oh, anyway, this is the idea how it works. So later on, when we go to the content, we use the same idea, either voting or then this word count. So second question for you, have you ever thought about starting your own business before or like right now, or do you think you would do that sometime in the future? Equal yes and no, very quick answers. Yes, it's getting there. The timing is an interesting question. Um, I'm teaching a lot of courses on entrepreneurship here at the Abu Dhabi University and actually have started my own, own two businesses so far. The other one I already discontinued. I, I dissolved it. And the other one I just started last year. It's an exciting journey. And the interesting question is that when is it the right time to get started? Like, is it better to start when you're young? Is it better to start when you're old? You have more experience? Well, I'd say it depends. There's no way to really say when that would work the best. But usually some experience, some exposure would definitely help. Maybe growing up with a family business gives you a good ground to know how to get started. Very good. But Confidence and some exposure to businesses would definitely help once you're thinking about starting a business. All right. So today we talk about entrepreneurship. So one of the things is like, why is entrepreneurship important? Why do we teach this kind of skills, specifically here in the UAE? And hopefully in the end of this workshop, you feel at least more confident and you have the skills to start a business. You know what to do, where to go. And exactly, build this confidence that you can do it, just like anybody. And it all really starts with this entrepreneurial mindset and kind of continuous improvement mindset. So there's always a way to do it better <clears throat> and you just have to find it. So businesses are not always about coming up with something completely new. <clears throat> it can be solving a problem and doing just the same thing that somebody else does, but do it better. And that can be a competitive advantage that really helps you make those millions that we all hope to make one day, I guess. But let's start with a little uh, definition. So entrepreneurship is this skills, understanding of how innovative, creative ideas, products and processes can be used to form new and successful businesses and existing firm to grow and expand. The key concept is really customer value. We talk about different companies and why is some company more successful than the other? And it's usually about the value they are able to give for their customers. We talk about the concept of value a bit later, but value can come with many terms. It can be like utility value, that this product is just very useful for you. It can be value in terms of saving time like home deliveries, you don't have to go somewhere. It's convenience. It can be environmental impact, like electronic cars, or it can be brand value, like Gucci. Also, these values are important, even they are not about utility or benefits in terms of using the product, but they are like aesthetic values, values of belonging to a group, image. These are also important things. And Definitely, you can build your competitive advantage also on those values. So let's talk about entrepreneurship then on the national level. So why is entrepreneurship important? 
what would you say if I ask you, this was a quiz, and you're asked, why is entrepreneurship important, let's say, in the UAE context, globally? Let's try to find a couple of things here. All right, very good things here. Uh, we had building skills, yes. We have security, we have growth. I would tap on to the topic of growth first. So you might know that there's a law here in the UAE that everybody who is uh, starting with a university degree, so if you're studying for a bachelor degree, you do have to take one course in entrepreneurship. So everybody who comes to university will be exposed to some of these uh, trainings. And the reason for that is what we call the innovation strategy uh, for the UAE. And the other one is this post oil economy. So we're building on capacity to go beyond the oil era. So what happens when the oil runs out and we want to build the income here on some other industries? So for that, we need some entrepreneurship. We need entrepreneurs who will create something new, create this economic growth here. Usually we also link entrepreneurship to establishing jobs. So as a business owner, you will most likely hire some people. So you're getting some more jobs. You're thinking we're building these skills, definitely. Because this entrepreneurial thinking and this mindset is also very useful if working on bigger companies. We call that as intrapreneurship. So in your organization, you take ownership of the things and you act as if your role was your own company. That means you are resource effective. You're always thinking of how to do things better, document your processes and try to build something new. So very good skills. Security, definitely and sharing skills with others. Very good things. But this uh, diversification and um, also these niche areas, there are always areas that a small company can do better than a big company. And it is quite astonishing how, like in Lebanon, over 30% of people under 30 are entrepreneurs. And according to like a two-year-old study here in the UAE, only 4% of young people under 30 had started their own business. So you see, it's still quite low figures. And I think one of the reasons is that the job security here has been pretty good. So there has not been any need to start your business. Whereas in some of the other economies, maybe there's no jobs. So the only way to have a job is to start your company. All right, so there's three ways to become an entrepreneur three way. So the first one is to buy a business. So when you're starting about entrepreneurship, we don't always have to think about starting from the scratch and um, doing this whole process of, of um, a startup from zero. There is a lot of websites where you can buy businesses. And actually right now, uh, during the COVID, it is actually quite a good, um, good way to start investing in business. You can get pretty good uh, deals because a lot of companies are struggling, as you know. And biggest issue with small companies is the cash flow. So they don't have savings. They don't have big, deep pockets like the big companies. So they have to sell just to maybe settle their uh, loans or their debt. And therefore, now it might be a good entry point for people to start their business. There are several websites uh, for buying businesses. And this is one of them. This is Business Exchange Bureau in Dubai. And uh, they have here different kinds of businesses. So you can buy businesses here. You can invest in a business or buy business assets. So let's say uh, you want to start your uh, restaurant, but you want to buy the, the kitchen, the whole kitchen utilities. So you can also buy that. So it's quite a useful uh, resource. 
Um, you can also sell things. So if you have a business to sell, or if you're looking for people to invest in your, in your company. But let's have a look into a couple of these companies. So how do they present them here? Let's have a, a corporate sports and business. So let's have a look at it. So this is how the businesses are featured on this website. So their asking price is 350,000. Obviously, it's good to have a professional to verify if this is a good price or is this over charging or under underestimated for the price. There are a couple of formulas, but today's session is not long enough to talk about how we can value the companies. Basically, it can be based on their assets, on their balance sheet, for those who've been studying business, or based on their income statement. So net present value of their estimated future cash flows. So how much money they are looking to make in the future. And like here, it doesn't look too bad if their assets is already 400,000 and they're selling it for 350. So it looks like they really want to make a quick sale. So there might be some room for negotiation. So it is a commercial use in Dubai, additional deep electricity. So it's basically a, a some kind of sports facility. And uh, there's a business overview, key products and services, competition, growth prospects, and reasons to buy. They usually also give the reasons to sell. But yeah, there's a lot of a lot of opportunities like that. And so you can become a business owner through buying. Here is some kind of spa for ladies, maybe. Their asking price is 580,000 and assets are 450,000. After 15 years in the UAE planning retirement. It's good to see how long the business has been up and running. Are they profitable? Are they continuously making money? And why are they selling? These are, of course, very important questions as well. Then the key question is that why would you rather buy than start your own business? I would say there's a couple of things. If the business is healthy, you are kind of on the way. You're like jumping into um, a speeding car already. So you don't have to start from the scratch. You don't have to build the reputation and the customer base. And you're already, let's say, halfway there. But you have to be wary. There's usually reasons why these uh, companies are sold. They might have some history of, of bad re reputation, relationships. So we really have to make a very thorough investigation on these companies before doing it. Another thing is, of course, that is this really your dream? Is this your idea? Is this something that you really want to do? But I think this can also be combined by buying a business. So like this spa, maybe I have some ideas for additional services that have not been um, provided in the UAE before, but maybe in the US, and I can start proposing these kind of services and that would then become my competitive edge at my own contribution to this business. But yeah, remember this. So first way to start your business, buy one or invest in one. The second one is franchising. And uh, there's also uh, several websites for franchising. Uh, so this is one of them, franchise.ae. And uh, they are featuring a lot of companies that are available for franchising. So I think we all when we think about franchising, we think about McDonald's or Starbucks or uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, something like this. So basically what it is, is that an American brand is giving you to run one of their um, locations here. Usually they are limited because they want to make sure that everybody who's doing this can make money. So if you have McDonald's in every corner, the competition is eating up everybody's business and nobody's making any money. So they are limiting the number of franchises that they give. And it's a competition. So they announced this opportunity, like here, let's say Sumo. I know Sumo Sushi, you know, in Mustard, they have one. So they apparently want to now give one more outlet like this. They're asking about some investment. See, it can be ranging from 5,000 to 15,000. Uh, they are giving some uh, frame condition that you have to fill. 
then you make your proposal. I would say the thing here is that it is a competition, so you should have some credentials already. So franchising, to win a franchisee with the big brand, you must have had another franchise before, maybe for a smaller brand. And you have to have something else to look credible in their eyes that you can make money for them because that's ultimately what they're looking for. I would say it's a good, uh, less risk-free, quite solid uh, business, uh, but uh, there are some hinges attached, like there is the franchisee fees that you can send back to your owner. And um, yeah, there's quite a lot of rules and regulations that you have to meet. But I would say that it will give a very good solid income usually if you do things right, but you're not going to get the millionaire doing franchising for another brand. So one opportunity, franchising. And uh, of course, you can be partnering with somebody who has more experience, and that could, might be your way to get started with franchising. So buying a business, franchising a business, or the third way of starting a business would be then, oops, sorry, would be here. Uh, am I still sharing? Did I lose something? I think I... Lost. Sorry. So the third way to start your business is to create one. And how do we create a business here in the UAE? So lucky for you, there's a lot of support instruments. So given the right type of activity, you might be able to start up your company for free. There's a lot of support programs like 2454 is giving for media. There are free zones where young entrepreneurs are supported. And like in now I see in Dubai, there are these announcements that start your business with 5,000 uh, dirhams. I would say if somebody asked me how much does it cost to start a business in the UAE, kind of rule of a thumb would usually be about 20,000. So that's like the average, average cost for starting a business. But there are cheaper versions. And like I said, there's a lot of opportunities to get into some incubation program, to get into government support program and get it done for free. Even here at the Abu Dhabi University, we have incubation program and we are supporting selected companies. If the ideas are good enough, get into the program and then we take care of the business license cost for you. But if you got this idea and you want to start your business, what you have to do first is determining the type of economic activity. So what this means is that once you get a business license, you can only operate in one specific area. Like my business license is management consulting. So I can do consulting. But if I want to start a restaurant, I can't do it with this license. I would need to get a new license for that economic activity. And you know, it makes sense. It is uh, pretty protecting the customers and making sure we have quality companies. So if I want to work in, let's say, medical care and I have no background, that could be even, even dangerous. So it, that is one of the ways that the government is supporting people here and making sure that it, we are limited into the industries that we know. So we have tourism, we have manufacturing, we have education, uh, healthcare, environmental support, marine, military, all these are kind of industries. And depending on that, you also then approach the right authorities to submit your application. If you're not a local, usually you need a local sponsor and you have to decide what is your legal form. Usually you can be a sole proprietor or then you can be a partnership if you have more partners than one, or you can become like a limited liability company, depending on really what your, your, what your objective is. Then we have to uh, register your trade name. There's also a cost if it's not Arabic, and they check that, can you register with this name? Or is there somebody else who have the same name? Or are you violating somebody's trademark? So we can't have a company called Cola Cola. It's too close to Coca-Cola. So these are the limitations. And then there's some paperwork that you have to submit. So usually they want to have um, 
your uh, own documentation. You need to have a, a license. Uh, you have to have an address for your business. You might need insurances, depending on what your company is, and um, some kind of business plan and uh, founding books for your company. So it is quite easy, actually. It can all be done online, and it's a matter of week before you can then get your license. So what I would recommend for anybody who's really seriously thinking about it is to browse those websites, thinking about what would be your activity and then start planning. And let's talk about now, now how we can do this planning. So let's start with then thinking that now we step into your shoes and you will become an entrepreneur. So what do you think? Do you think anybody can become an entrepreneur? Is this for everybody? Or do you have to have some certain skills that um, you pose before you can do that? Yeah, again, yes and no comes very fast. And this is very common. That's what I see a lot of times. So it's too bad we can't have the real interaction to also explain your answers. But I would... Uh, be kind of in the boat's minds as well. So in a way, yes, I would like to say that everybody can become an entrepreneur since there are different ways of becoming one. And on the other hand, I would also say no, since there are also people who are very uncomfortable out of their comfort zone. And if there's no clear procedures and rules on how to do things, they might be able to do it, but it can be too stressful for them in the long term. If you're looking into some of these very successful companies, like even Apple, they usually have like a pair. There's the one crazy innovator, and then there's the other one who's working in the background and kind of making sure everything gets done. So this kind of thing would work. So you don't have to be extroverted, super creative person and good presenter to become an entrepreneur. Maybe you have somebody who is doing that sales work for you and then we have somebody who is taking care of the implementation and the processes. So I'm also in the good mind, in two minds about that really, but I would like to say yes, definitely. It is a skill that can be learned, just like we can learn uh, leadership. The old thinking was that only you yeah, are born with these leadership skills, but now we believe that you can learn them and same with entrepreneurship. Definitely. So some characteristics that we usually associate with entrepreneurs are, first of all, this enthusiasm. So there's a saying that if you don't believe in your business, so who would? Imagination. So I think this is something that you see the best companies doing now during the COVID. So they had production facility for something completely different but they convert it into making sanitizing product or face mask or something. So they started thinking that how can this, this challenge become an opportunity for us? And always thinking about that. I had one of my students who is an entrepreneur and said that every Sunday morning, their little team starts with the meeting and everybody has to come up with five new ideas. They think it's like a numbers game. If you don't try to come up with something new, you never will. And some of the ideas are bad. Some of them might work, but you have to practice it. And the more you practice it, the better you come. We see that all the time. So he said that everybody is starting to stress out uh, then on Saturday night and trying to come up with some ideas. And But usually every Sunday, they have ideas on the table. Risk taking, obviously, is something we talk about Bill Owlett's model today. Bill Owlett is from MIT. He's one of the most famous authors and scholars for entrepreneurship. And his, his book's name is Disciplined Entrepreneur. It means that entrepreneurs must take risk, but it has to be calculated risk. Entrepreneurs have to make bold moves but they have to be disciplined in it. So you can't just be putting everything in one basket and you have to have exit strategies if it looks like it's not going to work. So before you lose more than you can afford to lose, you have to be able to step out. 
So we have to have the exit plan. Open-mindedness, curiosity, action orientation. These are definitely important skills. So this thing that once you move around, let's say at the COVID test queue or at the airport or in a government office registering your car, something like this, you can think about, so how could we do this better? How could we use artificial intelligence to make this process more seamless? How could we reduce the waiting times? This kind of thing. It doesn't mean that we are criticizing. It's not like we're walking around the world in a negative mindset, but I would call it improvement mindset. So a little bit judging, a little bit looking for opportunities for doing things better. And that can lead to really good ideas and improvement ideas for different processes or products. Strong-willed, courageous, creative, mature, and self-renewal. I would tap on to this thing about maturity. So we run a lot of innovation programs, innovation competitions, and so forth. And we come across good ideas and some ideas that maybe not so good. And we see situations where the judges or experts in what they do give some feedback for students, but the students start arguing back. They said, no, my idea is perfect. You just don't understand it. And they are just not taking the feedback. They think everything is perfect with their idea. So this doesn't exactly show maturity. I would say one of the key values of going into these kind of competitions is to get that feedback and to be able to improve your idea. So take it as a gift rather than trying to take it as a criticism. So this is, this is maybe where the maturity really comes into picture. It usually, there is the, the passion and there might be this danger that you really fall in love with your idea. And if anybody's saying anything about it, you become very emotional. This is the emotional attachment that entrepreneurs have to their businesses. So the question I posed in the beginning was that when to start? I would say that it is good to learn some of these technical skills and competencies just in order to avoid some of the mishaps and maybe costly mishaps sometimes. I would give an example of a, of a challenge that you might have would be bookkeeping. So basically when you're talking about your revenues, everything must be recorded. So whenever you sell something, you have to put it into your system, you have to give a receipt. And with that then end of the month, end of the year, we see how much you got in, how much money came in. Also you have to record all your expenses and you have to have the receipt. And the same happens end of the month, end of the year, you see what has been your spending. And obviously what is the, the difference between money coming in and out would be your profit. But what happens is the audits. There are um, co corporate audits whereby authorities come and check whether you have receipt of all the transaction and the income you reported and the cost that you reported are real. So in case you fail to do this process, you might end up paying some fines or even worse for fraud. So therefore, if you don't feel comfortable with your bookkeeping skills, there are a lot of accountants, accounting companies that you can pay some fee and they will do that for you. So rather than having these costly mistakes, just if that's not your stronghold, please use some company for that. Some other um, competencies that would be very useful is like idea generation. The creativity can also be learned. So you have to think, what is my creativity type? And what is my process of coming up with new ideas? Opportunity recognition is very important. So how can you seize the opportunities? Don't walk past them. If you see there is something where your idea would work, maybe in another industry, maybe for another customer segment, just try to tap onto the idea. Take an example that you thought about making let's say um, computer games for teenagers or gamers. But what if it doesn't fly? You could try to make it for old people or for children. 
just adjust and tweak the product to them to fit those target groups. Intellectual property is important if you're dealing with technology products. So how to product protect that. If you need to do patenting or copyright trademark, any of this protection. But even more important, I would say, is really walking in the shoes of the customer. So what do the customer want? What do they need? Mostly the best ideas really come from the customers or the users. So if I want to learn about how to better teach, I would and develop teaching technology, I would go ask teachers. If I make some medical imaging equipment, I would go ask the doctors and the nurses as the users of this technology. Strategy, business planning, very important skills, and also these intrapersonal skills like networking and articulating your ideas. This is where we come to this elevator speech that how to present your idea for somebody who doesn't know anything about it in three minutes, like in an elevator ride. So you have to be very clear, very precise, and maybe use metaphors. This is a very good way to describe something that doesn't exist yet. But let's talk about ideation. So I mentioned that a lot of the ideas come from the customers. So people who use these products on a daily basis, they will see the issues and they can start proposing some improvements. Just think about yourselves. You might be an expert on using a phone. So there's something that is always annoying you and it's just not working as well as it should. Or with some computer programs, with your school um, portals. So you could think, so how could this portal be better? So it's more convenient for teachers and students to use. One big thing is solving these um, problems. So where do you observe the people are struggling? Like traffic jam, it's a very, very typical issue. So how could we make traffic more, um, more um, tolerable? Issues with housing, how to reduce people's electricity bill. This could be an idea in terms of sustainability. Or how to improve people's uh, study skills. That would be one. You realize that maybe some students don't have good grades because they don't really know how to study. And do a consulting company on that. Different kind of things. But as mentioned, it's not always about new products. It can be also about business models, making money in a different way, or improve products that are already there in the market. And this is exact, extremely easy for, let's say, analog product. You can try to digitize them. Like now books are being audiobooks. How about toys are increasingly getting digital? Um, if we start with the daily needs that we have, a lot of the things a lot of the services we used could be brought home, it would be safe, it would be convenient. Think about these kind of things. Another thing is that we already have those services, but some of them are very bad. And it is okay to say that not all the services are best. And I'll just make one, one example here, maybe not something that you've been dealing much with, but fixing home appliances is notoriously bad, actually. Once you call a company, somebody's coming to fix your washing machine. It takes usually 10 phone calls before somebody's at your door. And uh, somehow it's just, they don't come when it's supposed to, and maybe the washing machine doesn't get fixed in the end. So these are just things. So last mile navigation, your food delivery or your Aramex is almost there. They find in their house, but they can't find your apartment very frustrating. So can we do some navigation apps for that? Or one more thing here, reincarnate an old product. So are there some products that we used to love, but they kind of disappeared? Just kind of up the, upgrade them and maybe they become a new trend. Trends are of course very important, the hot trends but I would be always a little bit wary. So it's better to be kind of in front of the trend curve than, than following it. But so what do you think? 
what could be good businesses? What kind of ideas would you have? You don't have to share your secrets, but what do you think would sell this year, 2021? Masks, yeah? Actually, very interesting. I was just reading some news this weekend about these new variances of COVID that they ask actually need some special kind of masks. So this, this general mask that we buy from the grocery store is just not going to be good enough. So different versions of mask. Again, it's there, but you can make a better version of it, uh, more secure. You can make it more uh, fashionable, customized, different sizes. It's not something that fits people. It is a lot of communication. I think all the web services is really good, good right now. Like think about the Zoom where we are right now or Google Classrooms, we have a Microsoft Teams. And I'm very actually unhappy about the fact that Google and Microsoft are the companies who are now dominating this market. It is just, it's so big and it's complex and they were able to move fast. I would love to see more startups in that screen and I'm sure there are many, but there are issues with data security. Even Zoom is not allowed by all the organizations. So you might remember what happened with Skype. That was from Estonia. Again, it's not allowed in, in a lot of countries. So it is not easy to step on the, stove, on the toes of Microsoft or Google. And we shouldn't go competing head to head with somebody like that. But find out your own niche. Like maybe be specialized for, for schools or Arabic or some include some regional features. Telehealth, very good. So people don't feel maybe comfortable going to your hospital with the fear of COVID and of course long queues and all that. Everything healthcare related, yeah, this year you'll definitely be a rehabilitation after you might have been exposed to the virus, these kind of things. Very good. But yeah, think about the niche. Again, you have to be niche that gives some value that the others can't provide. So this is where the good business ideas usually lie. I was looking into the best business ideas. These were actually some of the ideas. One was this data science. So now oh, everybody's collecting a lot of data and use this for search engine optimization to get more hits to your website or social media marketing or improving products based on the data. So business analytics, these kind of things would be also very good businesses if you are into, into computer and that. So how to generate ideas, where to get these ideas. And uh, here I put up some societal problems because it's not only about our daily lives, but think about government, think about B2B uh, sector. So there is a lot of room for innovation in security, cybersecurity, solutions to help uh, poverty. So we can also go look beyond our own communities and look for ideas for improvements there. The government innovation is very good in the UAE and uh, actually the public sector is one of the most innovative in the world. So also thinking about tapping onto that opportunity and providing services for the government. But what else? Engage in observation sessions. So see how people are using some services and how do they struggle with it. So seeing how people might have a hard time using some website or some app, or if there is some kind of a booth or kiosk, people don't know how to use it. So maybe this could be a way to improve it. Socialize outside your normal circles. We talk about this multidisciplinary and getting ideas from different places and to put them together, you come up with the killer product. And one example is of course, um, if it go into exercising. So usually these were like products and apps that were only used by maybe professional athletes or by military, but now even the normal users are using them. Even the pets, horses, dogs, camels, are using trackers and diet planning and these kind of things. 
So maybe you can put together something that is used in another industry or in another field and put it together in, in, in another one. But like, I think this like healing foods is one example of that. Not just organic, but these kind of foods that will uh, improve your immune system and really take you to the next level. Read books. Books are a good source or articles and online as well. Randomly surf the net. Yes, I think we all do that sometimes. Keep a journal. So if you have an idea, just write it down and maybe develop it and look at it from the different angles and just document your progress so you remember what you were thinking and where did you come from? Where do you think you're going with this idea? Then you can do meditating and structured exercises. There is this process of incubation. Like I think you all had it sometimes when you have an issue, homework or a problem. You think about it in the evening and you can't come up with any solution. And you think, 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 then you fall asleep. And in the morning when you wake up, the solution is there. And this is called the incubation. It's in the back of your mind and you have been thinking about it. You have kind of done the thinking work. And in your subconscious then during your sleep, the idea matures and in the morning it presents you as an idea. This is one of the processes. You have to trust the process and not to get too anxious and lose sleep over that night. But yeah, then you have this idea. You talk about a process of coming up with idea. But the next question is that, is this a good idea? If I think it's a good idea, is there enough customers for it? Do everybody else think it's a good idea? So we have to kind of market proof your idea. And of course, this would be done through some uh, market research. You can do qualitative like interviews or show the product at the mall for people and randomly ask for feedback. Or it can be surveys. You can study geographics. You can study demographics. So where there are a lot of people, uh, what are the needs for them? And uh, then there are statistics by the government and by the chambers of commerce. Like one statistics that I saw last year uh, was nurseries. Apparently but there is a huge need for more nurseries for Abu Dhabi. So there's just so many children and there's no places for them. Obviously this idea was not very good last year when the nurseries were closed, but maybe for the coming years, even more people with small children moving in. So these are just coming from the statistics that are kept by the government. But this value, so what do you have to then think that if you decide to go, let's say with your nursery idea, you have to make sure that you give the value for these customers that they really appreciate. Let's say that the nursery is one of it is definitely for busy parents. Maybe you have to drop your children before you go to work or something. So it has to be close by, maybe like a drive-in type of thing. Um, it has to be sec safe, secure, trusted. And of course, then the, government, the quality of the tuition has to be there. But these are kind of the quality product. This is definitely one. But it can also be cost. Like we all know, um, let's say Daiso. When you go to Daiso and you buy some Ramadan decorations, you know it's not going to last for you until the next year, but it's very cheap. So they are competing with price, not with the differentiation. It can be advantages of ownership. Like let's say you invest and buy uh, an apartment. You can rent it out and make some money when you don't need it. This is the kind of Airbnb idea as well. Image, like um, with some branding codes, company brand and affiliation access to a solution, and this could be like a license or if you buy um, rights to some game uh, or some add-ons add 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 to your game, experience or success from the use of the product. Let's say, for example, some um, additives. If you are into sports, you can have a better sports um, results if you are eating some kind of um, vitamins or a long-term takeaways. So it can be accumulated knowledge as well. So sometimes it's not immediate 
values, but it can come in a later stage. And now I ask you a question. So can you think of some examples of value, some values that you think some products are delivering to you? Like your phone, your computer, your Apple Watch? What kind of values? What, let's just talk about the concept of value. Like my value of these glasses is that I, I see better. Money saver, very good. So let's say if you're using some coupon or entertainer or something like that, money saving, of, of course. Or um, maybe using Uber, you can uh, save money on taxi. Better connection, yeah. So if you are having uh, better connectivity, better, let's say, uh, internet connection, time saving. Yeah, health, very good, like a gym, gives you health. Uh, quality, yes, if you have, let's say, very expensive sneakers, they will be very um, good for you in the longer term. So I think it's good. This was just testing, we're getting into what does this value really mean? And we usually talk about like utilitarian value, which means kind of in terms of in use, or then we can talk about brand value and even emotional value. Like, let's say you come from um, Egypt and you really miss home food while you're here. So e Egyptian restaurant is tapping onto this kind of emotional uh, cultural connection. Availability, very good. Money, yeah, there's some products that can help you make money. Like your Spotify or whatever, SoundCloud. You can sell, sell your music on SoundCloud. Um, quality, availability. Availability is important. And price, of course. Price is a very, very important uh, factor. So we can't always underestimate that. We made a study on the impact of these uh, sales. So if there is like a promotion in a shop and uh, and they reduced the say a product, let's say 30%. The increase in sale was immense. It was kind of for every product pretty much. Once you reduce the price, let's say more than 10%, this impact on sales is immediate. So these are really like uh, price sensitive products that we consume. So what is this market analysis then? So we're looking into your actual target market. So let's say you have an idea for some kind of product. You have to think, um, would you be selling that at your school? Or would you be selling it in a neighborhood? Would you be selling it in, in Abu Dhabi or in the UAE or globally? So with that, you can see what is the size of your possible market. Let's say um, I give an example of, um, let's say a housing community. Let's say in Dubai, we talk about Arabian ranches and you decide to start a nail salon there. Your potential customers are pretty much people who live there, female, age, something between something. But it's a little bit secluded. So I don't think anybody would actually go and drive from outside of that area to go there to get their um, manicures done. So let's say you make a study and you find that there's 5 million, 5,000 people, uh, 5,000 women in your target group live there. So this is your potential market. It's not realistic to think that anybody else is coming. Or like in our campus, we have a Starbucks. So other than people who actually come there to study or work, can't have access to the campus. So obviously then their potential market is that or your school canteen. It is basically the people who come there on a daily basis. And therefore they had to see how much are these people willing to pay, what kind of products they need. So you have to see these price breaks, culture as norms, purchasing patterns. I think people buy something at 
eight o'clock and maybe at lunch break, possibly at three. So you have to have products available then. You have to think how much people are willing to pay for it. And is there competition? Most likely the competition is the meals you bring from home. Of course, then the trends and business cycles as well. But always, this is something that I think a lot of the students get wrong that what is really my competition? Is the competition here locally or globally? And like for many of us, I think when we do our first startup, companies like Google or Microsoft are not really our competitors. They are in a, let's say, different categories. So one, idea of thinking how to deliver this customer value is the process of design thinking. This is something we teach at the university also on our entrepreneurship courses. So how it is um, happens is looking into the cycle. We first try to empathize with the people. We try to understand what is important for them. What are their pains and gains on using these products? Let's say it's somebody who is coming to a movie what do they want? They like to have fast coming in, getting a big variety of um, products and uh, snacks. So everything must be there. They must have a nice environment, good atmosphere, a good audio, uh, all this light, right temperature. So think about what things are important. What kind of values are these people looking for? Then you define, so what am I focusing on? You can't solve all the problems. So we have to define what is my contribution to this. Then you ideate solutions. So this is where you say we're staying in the problem zone. First, we really focus on the problem. And this is the difference with um, design thinking. Really focusing on understanding deeply, thoroughly what the issue is. Then we start ideating, making prototypes on what could the solution be then testing them with friendly users and all being well, you go on to launch your product. And this is basically the cycle that I'm sure you all have been working with in, in some of your projects, but design thinking has nice visuals and really step-by-step -step and a rule book on how to do that. The next thing is then about making money. So basic idea with the company is to make value for its stakeholders. So we do have companies that are nonprofit. So they are not focused on making a lot of money, but they do also have to make money to pay salaries for those people who work there. It is not charity. It is just not focusing on making profit, but it still has to have some kind of sustainable business model. So how do we make money? And this is a business model con canvas. We usually spend an hour at least on working on this. And now I'm going to go through in five minutes. So what is Business Model Canvas? It is basically a visual representation of how your company is making money. Here on the right-hand side, we describe how the money comes into your company, how the customers reach your product. And on the left-hand side, what do you need for delivering that value for the customer? So you start in the middle, what is your value proposition? Here in this canvas, there are a couple of guiding questions that you could ask. Ask yourself, so what value do I deliver? What problem do I solve? And what products do I uh, offer and for what segment? So if you have to start planning a business, this could be a very good tool to get started. Just this one page. If you're able to answer all these questions, I think you're in a very good place then to start writing more detailed plan for your business. So I could maybe use this as a very, very first thing. When your idea is clear, you know more or less what kind of product, what you want to serve and for who. Customer segments, you can have many customer segments. Obviously it's not just one, but we usually talk about primary customer and secondary customer. So who's your first customer? And then we go on to who else would be buying. There's also this saying that who is your dream customer? So let's say you're making a movie, maybe your dream customer is, is some big production um, place like Paramount Pictures or something like this. Or if you're in construction here, you want to have Aldar. 
it's a good reference for others. And it's really is that if they believe in me, also the others will. So references are very important. Then we talk about revenue streams down here. So where does the money come from? So what are you actually selling? What is where the dollars or the dirhams are changing hands? What is the very, very practical terms, the product that people are paying for? It is usually a product, it is a service, or it's the license. These are the most likely uh, op options for you. Channel, where do the customers meet you? Online, do you have a flagship store or do you have some exclusive distribution or is it available everywhere? And then about the relationships. So do these customer expect like customization, follow up after the sales, or is it just one transaction and that's it? Nothing else needed. I think car, car shops are pretty good, car dealerships. They follow up and they ask that, do you want to change now? You had this car for two years already and do you want to have some services? And now you should have driven another 10,000. So they really keep in up, keep a touch on their customers. On the left-hand side, we then see that where, what do we need for making this value? So what are your key activities and resources? So who do I need there? And what are these people doing? It doesn't mean like every, every resource that you have, like your office space might not, most likely is not your key resource, but maybe your know-how, your brand, your connections, these could be the key resources. But the key activities is what you basically do. The cost structure, what are the costs associated with your activities and resources? So basically the cost should be associated with these things. And who are your partners? Let's say you want to do something with recycling, the municipality has to be your partner. Otherwise you don't have access to, to, the, to the recycling uh, materials. But this is pretty much it. And maybe the key things think in, in the activities that what do you do yourself? And what do you outsource? So if you, let's say you're coming up with some new um, products, like a new scooter, new type of electric scooter, uh, are you designing it and sending the designs to China where somebody is manufacturing it for you? Or are you actually starting to set up a factory, factory a manufacturing facility here in the UAE? So these are decisions you have to, to make yourself for your business. And this is where I'll be finishing with. So this is from Bill Ollett's um, Disciplined Entrepreneur. It is showing really 24 product uh, steps for entrepreneurship. So these are the kind of checklist, 24 steps that you have to take, 24 questions that you have to be able to answer in order to be ready to launch your business. Sounds easy enough, right? But of course, there's always um, little twist. So it's not so easy to come up with answers to these questions. Uh, but they are really uh, divided into six categories. The first question is who is your customer? Second, what can you do to your customer? So this is the value. And how does your customer acquire your product? This will be the channel from the business model canvas. So we are kind of going around the same questions. How do you make money? It is easy to come up with the idea, but you have to think about uh, how can you actually make money on it? Every business has to be a sustainable. And how do you design and build your product? So are you doing it yourself? Somebody else is doing it and so forth. One example is apps. Like a lot of our students have ideas about some apps, but maybe they don't know how to create an app. That's fine. If you have the idea, you can actually make the specification. What is this app supposed to be doing? And there are companies that do it for a fee. You pay them a fee, they come up with your app. It can be risky since if there are glitches and that, if you have to always go back to them, it can start costing you a lot of money. But maybe you can start get started with that, somebody else designing it. And then later on you build capacity and knowledge in your company or hire somebody who can do it for you then. 
The last question is something a little bit new we didn't discuss yet. And this is about scaling your business. And this means how can you make it bigger? And how can you kind of copy this business in different environments and grow? Let's say about software. Software companies are making so much money because they only need to develop the product once. And basically then there's this scale economics when you just bring it out and distribute it for more people. And when we divide doing and developing actual products, you don't have the same. Still, you have to do the manufacturing and trans transformation process for every one of them specifically. But how can you think about scaling? How can you think about going to maybe other industries, different customer segments, different markets, once this market here is saturated? So there are different strategies for that too. But this is it. Starting with your customers, empathizing, understanding what the customer want, what can you do for them? And remember, you can't do everything, you have to be selective. And then how do you actually, in practice, implement it and make money on this? The biggest reasons, there's two biggest reasons why companies fail. You can do it, you can check it yourself, go on Google and check that why do startup fail? And the biggest reason is that there is no need for their uh, products. And this to me sounds so strange. So why would you start without making a research and knowing if there are customers? But again, it's not that simple. Sometimes the customers might be interested, but then there are maybe some switching costs. Let's say that um, you always used Apple and you want to switch to some other phone. But everything, your data, everything is under, under the Apple ID. And maybe you can't transfer them. So you're kind of locked into using that Apple product. Well, that's the first one. There's no need for the product. Or you get overcompeted then. Somebody else comes up with something same. And they can do it more faster, cheaper, uh, with higher quality. The second one is the cash flow. So you're running out of cash. And this can come up in the plans whereby it takes you longer to get on market than you planned. So let's say you invested a lot of money on making these products, but then there are some issues with market acceptance or license or something. It takes you a year before you actually get there. So can you survive that year before you're starting to get cash flows back to your company? In other countries than the UAE, this also goes with the tax. So a lot of times people can't pay their taxes. And this is one of the biggest reasons why the companies fail. So there's something to think about. And uh, maybe a little recap of our key terms today. So entrepreneurship, what it is, why is it important on national level, important on individual level, important also for big companies. Ideation, where do these ideas come from? So from the customers, from your past experience, from observations, from solving problems, maybe exporting something from another market to another market, these kind of ideas. Customer value, what kind of values are customer looking for? Why do we buy some products that we buy? And why are we more brand loyal to some products than some not? Design thinking as a process, of empathizing, ideating, idea, um, prototyping and testing products. Business model canvas as a way to get started, thinking about how the money comes into your company. And this entrepreneurial process. What are the 24 steps that you have to do in order to get to the market? So that was kind of quick and short uh, what I had for you today, just uh, sharing some of the ideas. These materials will be distributed for you. So hopefully, maybe you can revise it, start thinking if you want to start your business, you want to buy one, or you want to think, try your hand in franchising, whatever feels the most, let's say, convenient for you right now. All right, so let's see now then if we have anything on the Q&A or if we had some comments in the chat. Now it would be a very good time to talk. So here we had some questions. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking into all of this. 
we had some good comments. Uh, business might already have goodwill. That is a very good, good point. So jumping on to existing business can be a very good thing. Just to have to know what are the underpinnings. Everybody can become a company. If there is going to be successful, that's a good one, Marco. And if they're going to be burned out, that's another thing. I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs burning out. A rehabilitation center is very good. This is actually uh, also healthcare related. AI, definitely. AI, all this uh, machine learning, data science, these kind of things. Empathy map, very interesting, quite close to uh, the business model canvas. Empathy map is one of the tools we can use in the design thinking process. So really empathizing and mapping down people's needs and wants and pains and gains, what they talk about. Yeah, it is very much about uh, risk taking, especially in the growth phase, you do have to be able to take risk. And uh, yeah, you can become an entrepreneur without taking any risk. And I would say that that's the route that I'm taking right now. So only dealing with existing um, existing uh, contacts, but again, it's not a way to growth. You can become an entrepreneur with very small risk, but you're not going to be making millions or anything like that. Uh, there's a question for you, if I have my own business. Yes, I have my own business right now. I'm doing management consulting. So I have a consulting business and it is something that is not very active. Obviously I'm a professor at this university, so I'm very busy. I don't really have the luxury of time, but it's something that I like to start establishing and building networks and that. And once I decide to retire or something, something I can do more. I also had a family business with my sister and brother uh, in my home country. I'm from Finland. Uh, we had a factory actually, and we were making all kinds of paper-based products because my country is, is like Canada and it's full of forests and paper industry is very big. So we made like all the catering equipment, like napkins, paper cloth, disposable cups and cutleries, plates, these sort of things. But many actually quite uh, famous uh, designs as well. So we did the white ones, but also very nice designs. That was, it was nice business. My brother is, is running that. All right, so I am an entrepreneur, yes. And you have an entre aspiring entrepreneur here, very good. I have my children in high school actually here and I'm trying to get them to start their businesses. And one of them is making music. I always tell him to go on SoundCloud and, and put it up there and charge for it. And there's a lot of like freelancing websites also where you can do it if you have some kind of skills like tutoring, if you know some sports or music. This, you can put up yourself as a freelancer and maybe some other startups can tap onto your skills then. That could be that could be one. So there is a lot of opportunity, and um, just maybe think about this: What are your like uh, hobbies? What do you actually like to do? And is there some way to kind of creating your company around that? So if you can combine what you love and what you're good at, and make some money on that, that would be an amazing idea and something for longer term. So. Maybe think about these kind of ideas. I started actually having businesses, uh, businesses uh, trying to make money when I was about your age, I think 15 something. I play piano myself. So I uh, went to this old person's home. This is where like very old people live. And I went there once a week after school and I played piano for them and they paid some fee. I also gave piano lessons for um, primary school kids, like six, seven year olds. So, I mean, these are just entrepreneurial thinking. Yeah, if you like drumming and kittering, you know, there are young kids like who don't have the skills, but they have the ambition. So I think already at that age, you, you can definitely contribute to something for those who are just in the beginning of that. So just thinking, looking around you, where there might be a need, babysitting, tutoring for little kids. This online teaching is, is a real pain. So I think a lot of families might pay a little bit of money for somebody to help their children to tackle their homework. 
even they are just hobbies, but they can definitely, you know, grow into something different as well. There's of course these questions and answers about these online businesses and um, now they have relaxed the rules, but earlier like Instagram and um, Facebook uh, businesses were not actually illegal. But right now there's a new business category that you can have a business organizing parties, selling products or something on, on Facebook or Instagram as well. How about stability in a society, business risk associated with that? Uh, it's quite interesting when you talk about um, business risk and, and stability. So like in Europe, where I come from, 80% of the companies are startups or small companies. And the small companies defined as less than 30 employees. So they are many, but they're also quite small in terms of how many people they employ. So let's say that a startup or a small company goes bankrupt. Not so many people really lose their jobs. While if a bigger companies go down, like in my country, we have a good example, Nokia. I actually worked for Nokia myself before, my first job. And uh, yeah, it completely went down. And we did all the supplier networks, uh, companies who made products for Nokia, everything went bankrupt. Tens of thousands of people are losing their jobs. So that has a huge impact on the stability of the society already. And what was the solution actually? A lot of, they started a bridge program at Nokia. So they were supporting their old employees and giving them funds and training to start their businesses. So there was the same idea as here. When the oil runs out, they can't provide jobs anymore. Then maybe also these companies can help in people finding and starting their own businesses. But it can have a, an impact definitely. Uh, can we be a perfect entrepreneur? Oh, I don't know. Is there a perfect entrepreneur? It is a journey, I would say. Like if you're looking to Elon Musk, for example, now, somebody might say that he's a perfect en entrepreneur because he, uh, he had some quite innovative ideas and he's always coming up with something new. But he seemed to have a lot of issues with people also. And um, he's making a lot of wrong choices as well. Even he's also opening up his um, <clears throat> his specifications for the car. So he's trying to kind of promote the whole industry and our transition to electronics, so electric cars. So he's doing good things, but yeah, it's hit and miss, I guess. Um, um, it's now we're done with the slideshow. So we are here right now. So we are at the questions and answers. Yeah, the Tesla. Another one is uh, like Richard Branson. He seemed to be just making money on everything he's doing with his uh, Virgin, with his airline, with his uh, hotel businesses, with his space travel. And now everything is going down. He has publicly apologized for his employees that his businesses are not successful anymore. So I'd say a perfect entrepreneur is somebody who is taking risks, but not too much and being sustainable, being able to come up with something again and again, year after year. And it's not easy, like, you know, even Apple, he's been really, their share value have been going down and they've been criticized because not every phone is as good as the last one. So it is a journey, it has ups and downs definitely, but as long as the trajectory is, is positive and, and you keep on making money, so, and value, I think then, that's good enough. All right. I think that was it then. Uh, we will be done for today. Um, if there's anything you would be interested in asking me, you can have my contact information from Ms. Rima. And also then I would like to promote our competition. We have an entrepreneurship competition uh, called Step Up Shabab. It has just been launched and um, the deadline is on the 15th of February. So if you have innovative ideas, uh, please don't hesitate to send them to us. I think we will do it virtually this uh, final event, but I think we already have about 200 proposals from different schools in the UAE. And we'd love to have also your proposals. 
We have a different areas. We have sustainability, the UAE next uh, 50 years. Uh, we had um, social innovation. And I think we have technology in generally. And all kinds of ideas are coming in. We have a template on our website. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from your ideas as well. Let me just check my chat still. OK, thank you very much. Nice to hear from you. And we would love to hear from you in this step up, shove up still. Uh, let me just see if I can very quickly find out my step up, shove up. It is a, it's an annual competition. So yes, here is our website. So towards the next 50, I'm just going to copy this to our chat uh, here. I'm going to see all panelists and attendees. Here we go. Oh, didn't call it. This is it. So please consider also uh, participating in this competition. All right, with that, I would say thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interaction. And keep on innovating. Hopefully we hear from you in the future with your successful startups. All right, now then have a good evening and please consider participating in our competition.